Everybody, welcome to another very special episode of the Father Gamer Podcast. Where you get naked? No, every episode is special, if you haven't noticed. And no, there uh, is no nudity. There is no nudity. Every episode. <laughs> I don't know about that. Every episode is special. Okay, if you say so. I do say so. Because. You're the one with the ego. I, well, yeah, I'm <laughs> the best at it. So. But are you the best? Around. Yeah, nothing's gonna keep me down. So, guys, listeners, fans, people out there, um, we are back. Uh, last episode was really great to be back. Um, this is exactly one year. This day when we're recording is one year since I had my surgery. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. So you did tag me today, didn't you? Yeah. So one year. I didn't mean to. It just does that face. Mm-hmm. Facebook does that auto tag. Like, I tagged a couple people by accident. I was like, great. Yeah. yeah I'm okay well. with it. But, so it's been a year. It's been interesting. It's, uh, uh, we touched on it in the last episode, so go back and listen to that. But it, is, it has been, uh, it's been a wild ride. Uh, I, I, I tagged a thing today with some of my friends, but I noticed one of the things since I've lost the weight, um, uh, is, uh, I'm starting to look like my granddad at like the same age. <laughs> it's kind of crazy because I mean he, he was uh, actually starting into a health phase around my age oh, yeah. now when he was you know in his in his 40s. So it's kind of interesting to see. Did he have a scare? Um, I think he did, but he also had a huge like. My granddad was like one of the biggest influences in my life. Like he was an amazing man. He was a true like Renaissance man as mm-hmm. far as yeah, yeah he was athletic and he was intelligent he was he would quote you know chaucer and he would he would you know he just amazing person so it's kind of cool when i'm walking by the mirror and i kind of see like a hint of my granddad Mm -hmm. and i've never seen that before till i lost the weight so it's kind of it's kind of interesting to see i'm also getting he's got he had these curls in the back of his hair like a little bit and i'm starting to get that now too Mm -hmm. since since then so it's, it's it's cool it's a cool <laughs> moment. So this is the Father Gamer Podcast. I am Eric Gibbs, the Father Gamer. With me today is Mike. Yo. And uh, uh, we had a lot of fun. We went to AggieCon. Yes. Um, and uh, we have some interviews. Most of those won't be in this episode. We're, we're actually going to save them uh, for the next episode. But we do have a couple things that we did record at AggieCon. And um, some uh, an interview that we didn't, we just recorded, uh, and uh, but before we get into that, before we get into what we're doing and all that kind of stuff, let's talk about, we're going to be somewhere in uh, May. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, May 10th through the 12th. Yes, and Tara is so happy that is her birthday, is May 10th, <laughs> so um, yeah. 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 So that's going to be interesting. Uh, but. That something is what, Eric? Uh, well, yeah, well, it's not. Yeah, trust me. Anyway, <laughs> so we, uh, we're going to be at Comic Palooza in Houston, what? Texas. Yeah, I know. And What is this Comic Palooza you mentioned? Well, you talk about it if you want it, to. It's Comic Palooza. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we we are going to uh, uh, be doing a our first live show at Comic Palooza, yeah, which is crazy, 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 crazy. Yeah, we're going to be doing a live show, so that'll be really fun. We're going to be talking about the history of conventions and for that in live the US. show in the U.S. Well, I mean, we'll, specifically, we'll probably talk about outside the U.S. a little bit too, but. We'll talk about that, and we're gonna have a lot of other big discussions about uh, fandom uh, that weekend as well, Mm -hmm. and uh, lots of interviews, and have some special friends over and special guests. So, if you know what, if you can come to Texas to come to Comic Palooza on May tenth in Houston, Texas, come find us. Come find us. We'll uh, we'll give you a hug. That 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 should be it. Just just don't shank us afterward, please. I, where your mind goes sometimes, it's going back to the tail, apparently. 
<laughs> so, um, also, uh, we are still looking for uh, content creators to come on the show. If you have a specific podcast, have a podcast that's about a specific thing in fandom, like if you want to talk about certain kinds of horror movies or certain kinds of video games, or certain kind of, let us send us your info. Uh, you send it to at uh, Father Gamer at Twitter. Or at Silverhawks, no vowels on Twitter, and uh, let us know about your podcast, your YouTube, your Twitch, anything you want to do. Let us know. We'll bring you on, and we'll have a specific segment about that kind of thing. So, yeah. if, if you have an entire show about why Beast Man from uh, He Man <laughs> is the greatest character of all time, and I actually know somebody out there that probably would. Have We're looking that. at you, Justin. Uh, come on the show, and we'll talk about it. So, um, <laughs> so in this episode. We talked to uh, Travis, my buddy Travis, uh, who is working on a movie. My new buddy. Your new buddy, my Travis. My new buddy, yes. Travis. Not the original buddy, Travis. Well, that's an old Travis. There's a lot of Travises in the world, but there's only this Travis right now, so that makes sense. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to be talking to him about a movie that he's working on right now that uh, we're trying to get some crowdsourcing for, and we would really like your help. Because it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a it's a it's a small independent horror movie mm-hmm. that um, has another new buddy. Yes, Carrie O'Quinn, who, in case you didn't don't know, is the creator, the guy who started uh, Starlog and uh, Fangoria magazine and a bunch of other magazines that were very influential to a lot of us. In uh, you know the eighties, nineties, pretty mm-hmm. much you know around before the internet was a as big a deal as it was now. You can go on and look up the history of well of Beast Man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> before, even surprisingly, I knew of them. Be before uh, before that, uh, you had Fangoria. I mean, if you were big into you know scary things and things that go bump in the night and those kind of movies, Fangoria was your source. And, mm-hmm. and you know, in science fiction, Starlog. I mean, and so we have a great discussion with him on this episode as well, talking about how all that started and, uh, and his, you know, the movies working on with Travis. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, I got to go see uh, Shazam. Shazam. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Enjoyed it. A lot Got to see it whenever DC uh, at the did preview a two, of it, uh, like a preview two weeks early. So, uh, so we'll have that on there and on here. And uh, and you know what else we're gonna do? We're going to, uh, you know, this is we haven't done this in a while. We haven't done a taste test. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. And so I was at a local grocery store, and they have three. I'm only gonna do one flavor today. They had three flavors of new M and M's. And now that I'm not diabetic. I could could eat eat M&M's. And uh, they have Mexican jalapeno peanut M&M's. So we're going to try one of these at the very end of the show. We're going to try some of these and see how they taste. Do not ever say that fast. Otherwise, you might say something else. Mexican jalapeno peanut? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep saying it fast. Mexican jalapeno peanut. Mexican jalapeno peanut. Mexican jalapeno peanut. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So anyway, I, I don't hear anything terrible. I just sound... Stupid, but uh, we're we're going to uh, uh, eat some of those at the very end of the show. So uh, sit back, strap in, and uh, get ready for a brand new episode of the Father Gamer Podcast. I'm with Travis Johnquist, uh, filmmaker, and uh, you are making a you are making a movie right now. And uh, it's based on a short that you made. Can you can you talk about that right quick? Yeah, the film is. Uh, thank you for having me on. Eric. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was nice meeting you at uh, AggieCon. It was a really good event. Um, yeah, so the movie is called Evil for Dinner, and it's a it's a horror film starring Carrie O'Quinn, and he's the founder of Fangoria. So it's very much in that vein. Um, we made a short film a couple years ago. Um, it was ran about 18 minutes and then now we've, uh, worked on it for a little bit. Now we have a full 90 minute adventure of bloody, bloody, bloody fun. So it's basically a film about a family of cannibals who eat evil people and they are able to extend their lives. And it's Carrie and his two daughters and the two daughters 
kind of take that and go a little out of control with it. And that's where kind of we we kind of more teeter in the exploitation. So if you're a fan of a lot, a lot of fun horror films, high yeah. energy, this is definitely um, where we're going towards. What what got you into this? Where did you, where, what kind of like said, okay, uh, little Travis, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to start making movies. Like where, where, where did you start with that? Well, I was born in January 19. No, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. We'll go there. We'll start there. No. I'm fine with that. No, I've always loved movies. <laughs> um, yeah, The Shining. Yeah, it really, uh, it really fucked me up for a long time. Um, uh, I'm pretty oh, sure are we good with language? Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll let those fly. <laughs> um, no. So I've always loved film. <clears throat> I think when I was around like 14, 15 is when I really started getting into. Oh, I want to do this. And so I went to film school for a couple of years um, in Los Angeles at a place called Columbia College Hollywood. And uh, horror was never my thing. Like, I, I've always liked, uh, I mean, Martin Scorsese is definitely, those films are the ones that got me into it. Mm -hmm. But um, when I went to the film school, I found myself more as a writer. So I just started taking all the screenwriting classes I could and writing screenplays then. Um, and then kept going and going. And it wasn't until... Um, I moved to Austin that I really kind of delved into horror and meeting um, the star of the film, Cary O'Quinn, um, just seeing him. I've heard of Fangoria. I've heard of those magazines and Starlog and all that. But just as a friend hanging out with him, I would see people just lose their shit um, right. with um, all of this, just this fandom. And I was kind of really um, interested in that. And then... Um, I don't know if it was Austin that turned me on to horror, but I just started thinking about it and I got this idea of these characters. And then once I stepped in, I just couldn't stop. And, and then rewatched all the horror films that I always loved, like John Carpenter ones and, and, and you know, Don of the Dead, all of that stuff. And I started looking at it in a new light. And now I guess there's no turning back. I mean, I'm making one. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's almost a uh, very addictive Thing, especially when you start creating anything um it, it's it goes from that theoretical point of like oh one day i wish i could make movies or oh i wish i could make music or whatever and then when you start doing it it's hard to stop like it, it it's it's almost impossible you're in it yeah yeah <laughs> it's um um my, this is gonna get very little whatever but i remember my my, my granddad used to tell me this story about water bugs and we're gonna get into water bugs here for just a second um, <laughs> where, uh, you, you have these water bugs that are under the water and they always look up and they're like, God, one day I want to be out there. I want to, I want to see the world and, and do things. And then all of a sudden they become actual flying water bugs and they can't go back below anymore. And that's kind of like, once you do it, you can never like, you can never turn around. You can never do a normal job. <laughs> yeah. You, your you, brain's you, turned on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of how it was with the writing process too. Like, um, I've written a couple, uh, a couple other screenplays in different genres. And then once I started writing horror, it was a really weird thing. I would like write these like crazy scenes and I'm like, Oh man, I'm fucked up dude, but it's kind of good. <laughs> and then I would send it to people just horrified. Like, oh, like I remember sending the first, um, script of the short film to, to, um, some of the actors that were, that was interested in playing the roles. I was like, dude, they're going to take this and just tear this fucker up. They're going to fuck this. I'm not interested. And then they would come back to me with even more fucked up ideas. And I was like, well, now we're on to something. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're going to, uh, you kind of unleash this other side of, um, you know, humanity, but like you, you can present it in a, in somewhat of a redeeming way, um, was very fascinating to me, especially with these characters too where it's it's cannibalism but they're they're doing a good deed by eating evil people but then where they lose their own humanity too you know where they they get addicted to it and then all the fun starts and and there's a whole bunch of different influences in this film that uh is is pretty is pretty fun yeah it was where where, where did uh do you do you remember where you were kind of when you came up with the idea do you remember kind of the genesis of, of these characters well yeah so at first i wrote these characters i was like oh it'd be fun to have like you know kind of a a messed up family mm -hmm. um which is a big thing in horror 
and then to give them um, some kind of power, some kind of supernatural thing, and then it just kind of snowballed into there. And then the characters just kind of came up. Once I came up with them, it was really weird. Like, sometimes names are hard for me, mm-hmm. but these ones, Howdy, uh, April, and December, just kind of came out. And then once they came out, it was just, there was no, like, they were just writing themselves. And then the actors took it and went a whole nother uh, way with it. And, and that was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, so, so was, it, this, was this short the first thing you've ever directed? The short was the first thing I ever directed, yes. Okay. I've written about uh you know three or four screenplays um <laughs> only two or three that i'm actually alive that i'll show people uh, but, um but yeah that was the first thing that i directed and then that kind of almost made me kind of more confident too because it was like okay like this is something that i can do um if i work at it and so and i kind of like that whole process of starting yeah. from like the blank page and then seeing it through on set, and then the treachery of editing uh, oh, the process, yeah, that's which painful. is the worst and the it's the best and the worst part. <laughs> I hate editing. Like, I mean, it's amazing, but at the same time, because I mean, you get to shape it. You get to, you take all of the bits that you've been you've been creating, and then you put them together, and it's amazing when you're done. But that process is painful. Uh, I mean, you, you you see things where you're like, wow, this this. This worked really well at the time, but not so much now. And then, what is that like though for you? Like, okay, uh, uh, you're writing, and then all of a sudden, boom! Like stuff you've written is, is being acted out by people in front of you. I mean, what, what's that feeling for you? What was that like for the first time? It was a pretty. Uh, I think it was an adrenaline rush. So we shot the short. So it was 18 minutes, and we shot it in three days. The bulk of it in two days. So it was mm. two nights. Um, where we shot all the house stuff, and then we went out on the street um, like a week later and shot stuff. And it was – you kind of go on autopilot. It, it's it's a really – it's kind of a make it or break it point because you really find out – because what what I found was you're just solving problems. Right. Like you got the vision. You know what you want. But you're racing against time, and this is happening, and that's not happening. So you kind of really have to pull together as a team and kind of roll with the punches even though they're coming from like Mike Tyson, you know, it's just like right. a haymaker after haymaker after haymaker. Um, and it's, it was a really good feeling. And I, I felt that like, Oh, I can continue this. Um, and, but it's hard, you know, you just have to surround yourself with people that you can trust because there's decisions that had to be made within, you know, minutes. <laughs> you know? Right. It's like, if you make the wrong one, then it's going, you're going to have to work with it. And we had some of those. And then, and that's the beautiful part of editing is that you could fix some of that, but right. like, d- you don't want that. <laughs> no. no, it's, it's, I mean, this is a smaller, you know, thing, but even in this show, uh, I remember one of the worst mistakes I ever made to the cast as I'm being watched by some of them um, was to say, <laughs> don't worry guys, we can edit that. And, and then I don't know how many episodes it's a good, extra hour of my life having to edit something that I shouldn't, shouldn't have ever said that, that I have to edit. So, um, you, uh, yeah, you, you've got this, this you were, you're talking about surrounding yourself with people that, that you, uh, that you trust. That's, that's a huge process too. in, in creating something like this is okay. You've created this baby. You're, you're naked essentially. And, yeah. And that, that, what was that feeling for you? How, how did, how did that feel? Um, it was, it was good and terrifying. Uh, I mm-hmm. mean, when we actually showed the short, um, uh, for the first time at uh, the Alamo Draft House, that was a real terror. It was exactly like that. It was like, mm-hmm. oh, you're naked and you're just out there and there and you're being judged and everything. But um, leading up to it, you really have a good support. Um, a lot of these people that. Um, I made the film with was a mix of new people that I met and some friends. And so my producer, Tracy, who um, deserves a lot of credit, kind of really helped me. So like she invited me to shoot some behind the scenes on a photo shoot that she was doing. Mm -hmm. And so I just went there and just, you know, did some behind the scenes and it was a really cool photo shoot. And I saw how she ran 
her own photo shoot, like a set, and she was like moving it forward. I was like, all right, that's what I need. <laughs> I can't do that. So having that person help me kind of schedule stuff, plan stuff was really cool. Um, and then uh, the guy who did the music and the composing, his name is Matt Meyer, Mr. Matthew Meyer, Mr. Um, was uh, I work with him at the Ritz and I actually gave him that project. Um, so she was like, Oh, you could put some music to this. He's like, Oh, I'll take a look at it. And then I started talking about this thing I wrote. And so he, he read that and he's like, all right, <laughs> he started coming up with all this music for that before we even shot. So I, so there was a friendship there, you know what I mean? And, and some other people. And then through Tracy, she brought in other actors and actresses, that kind of knew each other. So in some weird way, they, it, it wasn't like a cast of strangers, even though some people mm -hmm. didn't meet, there was a connection throughout all of them. And so that kind of helped the process. Um, and, um, and that's, and, and then now going into the feature, we you know, you feel a lot more comfortable because now you're about, now we're about ready to embark into a 90 minute venture rather than an 18 minute venture. So kind of excited about that. So, so tell me about the, the actors. Um, who who are they or did you meet them <laughs> so tracy uh recommended lauren lauren reed and she plays december so i met with her and um we talked and and really agreed on like the material and liked it then she introduced me to danny trevino who plays alex and um and then we met really really headed off and then he introduced me to nelly nelly spanger and she uh plays april um and so those are the main cast now the the crazy villain dude his name is brian berryman and he's been my friend for a long 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 time and that is pretty much rounds up the cast and then of course carrie carrie yeah. o'quinn who plays howdy and carrie's been my friend for a while and um and I, 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 it's really weird like I think that's where kind of the start came from was like wanting to work with him and then just kind of writing this really crazy psychopathic character for him that in a sense, he, he like the character of how he wants to do good and Carrie just it, half the lines he didn't even are not even mine. He just took the script and started <laughs> rewriting them. And I was like, that's better than when I wrote go. <laughs> you know? So that kind of rounds off the, the, the main cast. Um, and th those are all the cast from the short film. And in the feature, there's a whole bunch of other characters that are going to be coming along and, and fucking things up for these guys. <laughs> what do you, what do you feel like it's going to be a lot of fun. What do you feel like you learned from doing the short, um, leading into doing the feature? Well, uh, kind of the scheduling, but mm -hmm. that's when you're working with low budget filmmaking, you kind of like, you're forced to, you're forced to kind of like really, really, um, pack everything in. Uh, the fight scene is probably the number one thing. There was a really cool minute fight scene in the short film that we shot in about four to six hours. And I would have liked to do the whole day. And, um, so leading in to the feature of the stuff that we're going to shoot with a, like the heavy, heavy violence really take the time for that because, um, our special effects, um, girl, Taylor Haggard, who works at the house of torment, so she's used to like really high budget, you know, right. um, um, you know, effects. I would like to give her more time to really go into detail with the special effects and blood. So a little bit of more timing and scheduling I would learn, uh, or I, I have learned, but like I said, like, I mean, looking back at it, like we had those days and that's where the days that we had. And it, it kind of lined up to where everyone was free those days. So you just try to plan as best you can. And then when Murphy's all comes around, you know, do the best you can. <laughs> you know? well, that's the thing. That's the thing with, with any of these, especially when you're, when you're starting out, the uh, scheduling is always, it, it's always a pain in the ass just, just to get everybody there to do what's got to get done. But, um, you know, moving forward, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see. I mean, uh, you, you have, yeah, you saw the footage. Yeah. You, I saw you've the got footage. some inside knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of blood. Like, like it, um, Carrie absolutely, uh, revels in that 
that part. Like you can tell oh, he just becomes it. Yeah. It's really fun. And um and and he he really he, he's a bunch of fun to work with because and that's a funny story that I like to tell. Like so, the first time I gave him um that uh that script is is pretty funny. So the fr- like the first draft of the the short film. Now I also rent um a room at his place here in austin so we have there's that there that comes into play as in i give him the script and he goes this is a terrifying script i don't know what you want this is absolutely sick and disgusting and you scare me (laughs) and that's all and that's all he said and i saw this text message like oh well fuck dude like not only is that gonna be the movie but now he's got a fuck. He, in his mind, he there's a psychopath in his house. You know what I mean? And that's live, which you might not be wrong about that. And I was like, what can you say to that? And so through time, we kept working and working and working um, with the character, and he came around. So, and then we shot we shot it in this house, um, and and it's a beautiful house here um, in the heart of Austin, Texas, and it's got a really old kind of creepy vibe. Um, that I'm sure he doesn't like to hear, <laughs> but it does. <laughs> and so, um, that's, that's, that's just a funny, you just got to keep working and working at, and he really now is all in, like now he's always yeah. like, all right, what are we doing? What are we doing? And, um, sometimes I just call him howdy. He is howdy. <laughs> well, yeah, talk- I might've touched a, an alter ego. <laughs> well, talking, talking to him and Aggie Khan and, uh, You'll hear that interview next. Um, talking to him, uh, you, his eyes lit up just talking about doing it. And you can tell, I mean, he's just excited to do it. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, the, he's, he's, he's the star of it. And it's definitely touching an audience that uh, he's been involved in for all these years. You oh, know, he helped, like he helped create it like that. audience, yeah. And uh, that it's such an important milestone. I mean, to anybody of, well, definitely of a certain age, um, the stuff that the, the the stuff that he created uh, was the only way that we could follow. Uh, you know, there was and, no internet. Uh, no, no, and so it, it's a very important thing, and you know, he's a very important person in in all of those fandoms, and so to, to uh, uh, you know. Giving him this time is great. To let him to play around with that part is amazing. Yeah, it's, and I'm glad that you you, you saw that, so you you kind of know exactly where we're going. Yeah, <laughs> and and him and, and so like so he's kind of so his character is I, I kind of like look at him as the guy that is kind of neutral and keeping everything together, while all these other characters around him are those characters in those magazines that he created. <laughs> you know, they're all those crazy, crazy, uh, like he's living this, uh, the, his, his fantasy is coming around. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's in the middle of one of these movies that he, um, helped promote back then. And, and, uh, and all behind the scenes. And, uh, he's, he's, he's all in, and he's a bunch of fun too. Even with the promoting of the film. Well, heck with he, you guys did it South by Southwest. That footage I'll have is, is amazing. Yeah, that was that was really cool. So, um, what we did for South by Southwest is we had we rolled about twelve deep. Uh, it was like the the peak of the festival that Friday night, and we took the cast, uh, some of the cast and the crew, and some of my friends, and we just dressed up all in horror makeup, and we started shouting and screaming, and and we had these big posters and handing out flyers to promote um, our crowdfunding campaign. And, um, he, and he was there and people just came up to him. They're like, Oh, where's this? And it's like, you, you talk about Fangoria and then bam, there's a fan. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? And so they were taking pictures with him and, and he's just doing his thing. And then we ended up posting up at this bar at Jackalope, um, and just hanging out. And then there was just people who, who, who knew him, who just recognized them. Right. And, um, and, and, and to see them completely, um just give themselves away like oh and thank you for all the memories and and all of this um stuff that we gravitated towards um it was a really cool I mean, it was a clusterfuck at south by so Why there was that? a lot that, you know, so, so to see anyway, those moments it was so, great well i mean and, and he he's so animated and so just 
excited. That's that's the greatest part of this is just just to see um, him so excited to do this. And and, and you know, I, I talked to you briefly at AggieCon, and I can see that's that's one of the reasons that we decided to get behind uh, you guys doing this is I can see the passion, and I can see the reverence for you know the stuff that Carrie's done, and um, I can see the love of the craft and anything like anytime you see that, that's something that you need to, you know, support and stand behind. Oh, well, thank you. You're, you're an ally in our bloody adventure. Absolutely. It's definitely been a long time coming and now it's, and now it's ready to, to come to light. You know, it, it took me. So the reason why there was a gap between the short film that we did in 2017 and so now where we're, um, we're ready to take off in, in 2019 was, I had an idea for uh, I had an idea in mind when I was doing the short, like oh these are where these characters are going to go. So when I started writing the screenplay, it just took another turn, and it kept taking turns and turns and turns. And so it took me um, a year to write it, and um, it, it was you know because you're you're anything that you're very passionate and you love, you want to do it right then and there. You know what right. I mean? There, there is no tomorrow. You're doing it today. Right. But it took some time to flesh out. I had to go through a couple drafts and and show it to uh, some of my friends and um, not only is uh, Matthew Meyer uh, doing the music but he really helped with creating and crafting the screenplay and now I think we really got a uh, now now we have something we can stand behind mm -hmm. um, and um, and it's ten times more crazy than the short film and I don't think I would have had it any other way because you kind of had to take the time to actually it, and it, you know what I mean? And, and like I said, it's a trashy oh, movie. So when someone sees it, they're going to go, what the hell? And, but, you know, it took some time to, to flesh out these characters. And well, a good story about that, too, a big influence was Troma. I've yeah. always um, been a uh, – I've always known about the Toxic Avenger and all those movies. But it was really – I was having a hard time writing the screenplay. And I was at this bar, and they were playing Terra Firmer. And I'd oh, never God. seen Terra Firmer before. Yeah. And I watched it. And I was, and I was just, and I was a real depressed day too. I was like, God damn it, dude, I can't break this wall. I, I, I think I was taking, I was taking the movie too seriously and the mythology of these characters. And I watched that movie, and I was like, dude, that's that's exploitation. And so then I remember telling um, my friend, I was like, dude, I just watched this movie. I think we we got to go a little bit more crazy. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a trauma film. And I was like, yeah, I've heard about trauma. And then I just doubled down on all of their movies. <laughs> so now it's like um, a huge influence of um, having fun. I mean, if you're not Absolutely. having fun, you know, then what are you doing? Oh, yeah. That's that's one thing you can say about trauma. They've never taken themselves too seriously. Like, you're definitely not going to uh, – Daniel Day-Lewis is not going to be in a trauma film. But no, that's, that's it doesn't okay. need to be. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Because you know what? Not every movie needs to be. A Daniel Day Lewis movie. No, so. there's a time and place for everything, you yeah. know. And then you know, maybe you know, in a, in a few years, we'll do this uh, podcast interview again, and then <laughs> I'll be doing some crazy Braveheart movie. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but that's we're not true. there yet. <laughs> no, but trying the Toxic Avenger, but you know, it's 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 crazy too how um, you you can perceive you know stuff that you've grown up around one way, and then all of a sudden it clicks, and that's it's definitely. Like I know, I know. Growing up, um, yeah, I was kind of a auteur type of movie person. Like that was, I mean, there were there were definitely I loved horror and stuff, but it was always the you know the American Werewolf in London kind of thing. Like, and then mm, yeah. some, somewhere around college, it was like, and I think it's a lot of people. It was like, oh, I appreciate these things. And then when we started having uh, good tacos, bad movie night kind of thing and it became, uh, <laughs> that's a good idea <laughs> oh it's great we, we've been doing it for years and uh like i can tell you this we <clears throat> there's some movies out there that are made I don't, have you ever seen rubber mm -mm. it's a movie about a tire that uh, is inhabited by some entity and uh can scanners people like blow up their brains <laughs> and it rolls around the desert and it ends up at a hotel and actually the cleaning lady comes in and it's looking at porn. It's looking up like a, uh, a tire magazine and ends up exploding her. Head. It's it's crazy. Like it is. And you know what? It's a great movie. 
it's that just, sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm it's just a that. fun, fun movie. And, and, and that's the thing. That's the first thing me and Lachlan, uh, when we were watching some of the footage, we just kind of looked at each other. was like, okay, yeah, we get it. We like it. This is fun. This is something we can get behind. So, uh, yeah, there's different, and even within horror too, there's yeah. different types of like you know you have the Exorcist or The Shining, where it's like, right. all right, you're gonna sit there and you're gonna think about some some shit that you might not want to think about, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and that's scary. And then there's uh, a bloody fun time, you know, having these these trauma films that maybe aren't even horror, but they're just almost like comedy horror. By the way, um, bloody and kind fun of, time like even like the thing, the, and the, the thing is movie. probably not even like a comedy, but I just enjoyed that movie so much because it, the tension was there you know what i mean oh, yeah. and it's not like deep existential but like that was so much fun watching these characters the paranoia and the horror was just so overwhelming and any kind of darn carpenter movie like oh, yeah. that that's all that's and then we wanted to do something like that with the soundtrack too i mean it's definitely a huge influence on us oh yeah i the thing is definitely one of my favorite movies of all time and so uh I get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're on the same board. <laughs> we are definitely we we we've had a few discussions since since AggieCon, and we're definitely on the same page on a lot of that stuff. Um, so you know we're behind, we're behind the uh, the, the movie. But where can other people, if they want to uh, donate and 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 you know help out this movie, where can they go? Well, we have a crowdfunding um, platform launched on Seed and Spark. So seedandspark.com forward slash evil for dinner. Or you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, and that's Facebook uh, forward slash evil for dinner, Instagram forward slash uh, evil for dinner. And you can follow us. And then we have all of our promo material there ready for you guys. Um, and um, get be- there's a lot of good perks too, on um, and a lot of good trophies you can have. And we're already feeling the heat, too. Facebook has censored us on yeah. one of our posts. So we're definitely working uphill. <laughs> so please help and support us. It was really funny because they flagged one of our posts. Um, and uh, it wasn't even the stuff that we have in our back pocket like you've seen. Like the, I was like, right. we got censored. Like, all right, well, let's do the blood cannon stuff. <laughs> oh, know? my God. Like, let's give yeah. them some real explicit material. Okay. Yeah. It's like, obviously, you're doing it right if Facebook is censoring you. I mean, that's, that's the first thing. I mean, but. Um, I think that's the new thing now these days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, We're doing something right. <laughs> absolutely. And, and uh, I, I, I want to crack at the blood cannon. I just, that's all I got to say. Like, I think I've talked about it two or three times already. Like, I want to crack at that blood cannon. Like, that thing is, that thing is awesome. Yeah, and uh, we're yeah, we're, and that footage is about ready to uh, be um, you know released too, and and that's a real fun thing too. So Taylor, when we were doing the short, now that's a story too, um, yeah. for people dealing with adversity. We were doing the short, and uh, we didn't really have a makeup effects person. We had people that could do it, but we really didn't have one person for that job. And so someone gave me Taylor's contact. We started talking and working uh, something out. And then the day of the shoot, like in the morning, we uh, finally, you know, made a good deal. And she came and last minute and then she brought this blood cannon. And what a blood cannon is, is basically a shotgun of blood. And if you look at it, it's, it's like this big <laughs> cartridge thing and it's hooked up to a compressor. And once it gets up to, it's got a whole bunch of power and then uh, it shoots out and it just kind of be, became a fun thing. And so when we were doing the promo videos, I, I asked Taylor, I was like, oh, we need some makeup effects. And, and I really didn't think about the blood cannon. And she was like, well, should I bring the blood cannon? And I was like, well, now that it's brought up, <laughs> I can't say no. And so we just took this thing and started shooting it around. And um, it's our favorite tool now. Not like, you know, <laughs> just like how Troma has the car flip in almost all of their movies, we might right. have a blood cannon. I could make a romantic comedy and we'll have a blood cannon. I, I, you think, I, I think you should, just, <laughs> you should totally name the blood cannon Pollock. I mean, it's just <laughs> perfect for that. Yeah, that, that, I mean, I saw that. I was like, yeah, okay. I've got to play with that somehow. I mean, I don't care what, but that's got to happen. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is very messy, too. So the footage that you're talking about, it's just like when you get shot with it, 
So like I so I, I shot some of the the actors and actresses in the short film with it, mm-hmm. and we're like doing multiple takes, and they're like, oh really, another mul- another take, and I was like, yeah yeah, it's good. So then the promo, I was like, all right, well I'll get shot with it, and I remember getting shot with it, and I was like, oh my god, this is overwhelming. They're like, all right, we got to redo it again, and I was like, again. <laughs> so Welcome I kind of felt the pain of the actors. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. Well, that's good though. That's good because when you're doing it, at least when you go, okay, this is the thirtieth take. Um, uh, I feel bad for you. I've done it, but um, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's for the love of art. <laughs> yes. So, um, uh, you know, how much blood are we talking for this movie? Do you want? I mean, like, are we talking like buckets? Or are we talking like uh, pulling up a truck? Well, okay. So we went through three gallons for the short film in oh, eighteen good. minutes. Okay, good. So now we're going ninety minutes. With way more explicit, oh, yeah, we might have a semi of blood, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a semi truck of blood it's in the budget. Um, it's that type of film, you know. It's just yeah. like, we, it, you know, um, you know, it's like the early Peter Jackson movies, you know, those splatter oh, yeah. films. You uh, know what I mean? Um, like those, those are really inspirational to like where it's almost it goes to a point where oh wow that's a lot of blood, and then it goes to a point where oh wow, that's really comedic. And then it goes to a point like, oh, all right, well, we're all in. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so if we get to that point, yeah, I think um, we it, have something. It's, uh, uh, God, uh, I cannot remember the name of the, the one with that he had used the lawnmower. Uh, oh, oh, I well, think it's Dead Alive. Yeah, oh, I love that yeah. movie. Yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, if it's in that category of blood, then we're good. We're totally good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, and, and we were, we were thinking about like, oh, how do we want to shoot it? And we were like, oh, we can have like a splatter film, but we'll shoot it like Suspiria or like a comic book <laughs> where it's all these really well, cra- like all these crazy colors and, and really well thought out like um, set design and then just completely trash it. And I think that's that's where we um, <laughs> we want to go. <laughs> I just have this image of like uh, Carrie's like, hey, wait a minute. This this is my house. <laughs> It's yeah, so that blood. was uh, that was an issue, um, <laughs> but uh, he was a trooper. Um, there was uh, luckily most of the the a lot of the bloods were the exterior for the fight scenes, uh-huh. but yeah, once um, you know people started getting you know gashes and stuff inside of the house, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. But he was a trooper, and especially with a lot of the content too, like you know with um, all the the you know sitting down and and just basically. Because this is his house that he's you know, lived and grown up in, and then now we're shooting this crazy horror film, you know, with ultra, you know, sex and violence. Um, he just loved it. Yeah, so, I mean, he's he's been, co- he's been covering this stuff for, I mean, what, fifty years? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, crazy. He gets to have it literally in his own backyard. So yeah, it's and and it, like yeah, for someone who kind of came up with the that whole cult following with like, you know, Freddy Krueger and and the whole Jason movies and and Alien and all that stuff and now to be in one of those movies um with a character that he's just doubled down on which is is really satisfying too because um like like I said, I've always written screenplays. I've always felt comfortable writing, but now when you know stepping up to try to actually be the you know one who's going to direct it and actually make the fucker, uh, it's really cool <laughs> to see someone who kind of really uh, takes it in. And um, and Danny Trevino, all the actors, Lauren Nelly are all like really great in the film, and they take and they take the the characters, the sisters, and just and just really knock those out of the park. So I can't um express you know enough gratitude towards them um and you'll be seeing a lot of them um here coming up i mean they really take these characters it's almost like i kind of like really think of like kind of almost like a comic book characters you know Mm -hmm. what i mean where they're so over the top um and they're so different um where april is now like more looking for love and kind of more of a romantic and december is just a psychopath and then Howdy's the dad trying to bring them together. They're, they're so different, but yet they're kind of um, a dysfunctional family, which I think um, a lot of people can relate to, even if they don't want to admit it. You know, most families are dysfunctional. Oh, yeah, We're absolutely. just going with, you know, crazy cannibals and incest. Yeah. You know? we're, all, we're all effed up. It's just a lot less cannibalism. I mean, 
depending, I guess, where you're <laughs> at. But, um, you know, it, it's it's got to be really amazing um, to to see all that uh, unfolding, especially in, in like right in front of you. Your these are your babies. Yeah. And and so, um, you know, we're going to continue to support and and be there. Uh, for this project, we're, we're 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 stepping completely behind it, and I hope everyone listening uh, will, you know, go to the links and 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 step up and 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 help uh, fund this. This is you can tell Travis has a great passion. This crew has a great passion to, to make this project, and um, we're excited to help get it made. Yeah, and and also for your listeners too that you can be in the movie. Yeah. Um, we, we would, there's a lot of perks on the crowdfunding where you can be in it. Um, and if you're in the local Austin area or anywhere in Texas, or even if you're in Canada and you want to fly down, like the more the help, the better. Um, it's all, um, independent. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all like, and a lot of the people who are working on the, uh, on the film, um, have their own, you know, um, careers and, and, and are musicians and models and painters and all sorts of um, all, all sorts of different backgrounds in the arts, and so it really is a community of people who love to uh, make art. And in this film um, specifically, it's um, a love of horror, <laughs> you know, right. and Absolutely. really having a fun time, and then maybe even learning something at the end of the venture. You know, there's a lot of different kind of philosophies that are said in the film too of um, what's right and what's wrong while they're doing these crazy acts. So, you know, you might, uh, you might have some fun. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to continue to have you on through the process and, uh, like to get some of the actors on. And of course, if you keep listening to this episode, we're going to have, uh, an interview with Carrie in just a few moments. So um, the Godfather, <laughs> absolutely. Travis, it's been awesome. We're going to keep having you on. Uh, you cool with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll uh, thank you, you guys uh, for supporting, and uh, and I support you guys and and your venture. And um, you know, it's definitely you know fun to talk and be around other people who are you know who who have a passion for the creative arts. Oh yeah, absolutely. You could you, like the moment we started talking, and I can I was like, okay, we got, we got that twin spirit going on. So we, we we're definitely yeah, dude. I, that was such a crazy moment too, because like that was a that I, if we can kind of paint the picture. For like that meeting, it was like we, we did the presentation and then um, and then everyone left the auditorium. And so AggieCon had a whole bunch of booths and everything. So this was the Sunday. This was the last day. And it was a clusterfuck of people kind of like getting up and leaving. And, and then Eric and I kind of met into each other and we're both like, you know, kind of like it, it, I understand the third day of any kind of con or festival is a clusterfuck. I've done some booths, you know what I mean? The third day people, it was just a weird kind of, um, yeah. uh, vibe, but I loved it. And it was definitely meant to, you know, we we're definitely meant to run into each other. So thank absolutely, you. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Well, we will definitely have you on. And like I said, I want to have uh, the rest of the, the, the cast on at some point and, uh, maybe do some other projects and, uh, and, and, you know, through the process of the, the filming too, like talk about stuff and what we're learning and, uh, and yeah, definitely forward. we're in it. Absolutely. <laughs> we're in it. Well, thank, so, uh, you know, thank, we're on the journey. Thank you so much, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was Travis and uh, awesome guy. Awesome. Like a lot of passion, incredible, a lot of pa- incredible, just amazing amount of passion for this project and uh, we got to see at AggieCon we got to actually see uh, some of the early footage and some of the stuff from the short that they made and it's perfectly like you like he described it's a very almost trauma esque <laughs> I mean blood a <clears throat> uh, little bit of sex exploitation it's it's a fun gory time and I'm excited to to help get this thing done like i i want to see this this made yeah and i you know it's kind of cool that somebody that's very so influential in that that particular fandom's culture and the growth of it is on this show talking about how that started but also about his involvement with this project and that's coming up that's carrie carrie's awesome yeah 
Carrie is amazing. Carrie's a great so, guy. He's cool. Uh, we're going to go straight into Hinda's interview, and then we'll be right back. Hi, um, I'm here with Carrie O'Quinn, um, and uh, you've been very influential in the fandom scene for a very, very long time. Um, can you take me back? Uh, you started. You, you grew up in Austin, correct? Yes, I was born and raised in Austin and went through the University of Texas there for several years and then moved to New York after I finished the university, lived in New York most of my life, and now, uh, since 2001, I've been living in Hollywood. I still have my home in Austin. Mm -hmm. I still go back there from time to time, and I am thrilled to be back here in College Station for AggieCon. I'm incredibly happy to have you back. It's, well, it's a uh, uh, I mean, 50 years this con's been going on. I know. It's Isn't crazy. that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. This this con was started before Comic Con in San Diego. That's This phenomenal. con was started before I created Starlog Magazine in 1976. That's great. This this so, con existed before the internet existed. Well, <laughs> so, so take me back, um, just just a little bit. Um, what was that initial spark that started everything for you? What what was was there a movie? Was there a book? Was there something? What what kind of started your fandom and your, your road to where you are now? Do you know? I I don't know if I can point to one particular thing, except that from the time I was a little kid. I was, uh, my first hero was Mighty Mouse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just loved the idea of somebody who was a superhero and who could save the day and who sang as he flew. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I, I grew from, you know, Mighty Mouse to uh, Captain Marvel was yeah. my next hero. Mm -hmm. And then I grew on to uh, Flash Gordon. And from the time I was a kid, I was in love with superheroes and people who fought for truth, justice, and a better life, and who made the world a better place, and who, you know, could take me and my imagination beyond the trivia of everyday life and let me see a vision of tomorrow that was more exciting to me and motivated me to try to make my own life have some of that excitement and some of that battle in it. Uh, I, was, I was kind of in love with science fiction. I don't know why. I mean, I grew up in the 50s watching the George Powell movies, mm -hmm. Destination Moon and When Worlds Collide and The Conquest of Space and all of those because they showed me uh, a world beyond the everyday trivia right. and what was possible. And I remember asking my mother as a little kid, do you think we'll ever land on the moon? Do you think anyone will ever set foot on the moon? And she said, I think that will happen in your lifetime. And that was the most exciting thing my mother could have told me. That's, that's, that's phenomenal to hear, especially... I mean, she got to see it too. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. That's, 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 so, when pretty much up until around Star Wars, a little bit, maybe Planet of the Apes time period, um, sci fi was pretty much relegated to children and freaks, as some people call it, as fans. And then came along Starlock and the, the stuff that you brought to the table. What was the initial start of that? What, what started you on that voyage? Well, uh, to be very honest, the, the roots of Starlog happened in a very strange way because mm -hmm. my partner and I had opened the doors of our publishing company in New York uh, several years earlier, about 1972. And we started with a soap opera fan magazine because there at the time there were more than 15 daily soap operas on the air that people were addicted to. Right. They were watching them five days a week and the people on the soap operas were very real to them. It was like their family. And they followed their lives as they evolved. And and 
it was pretty much the way fans are today about Star Trek and Star Wars and all of that. Right. But these were soap opera fans, and there was no good, legitimate magazine that covered that field seriously. And so we knew there was a huge audience, millions of people out there, and that they didn't have a magazine, which was the way people got their information in those days before the Internet. They didn't have a magazine that kept them up to date and, and gave them interviews with the actors. And so we started a magazine called Daily TV Serials. And lo and behold, it became successful because there was indeed an audience for that sort of thing. And I learned from that how to service a fan audience in a way that they had never been... Uh, they'd never had anything delivered to them like what I was giving them. And then, because we were kind of a struggling publishing company at that time, we took on jobs for other publishers, and we would package magazines for them because we knew how to do it. And so we would put together a magazine for another publisher that they wanted. And when one of these publishers asked us to do a magazine about Star Trek, because Star Trek was off the air at that right. time. It had been off the air for several years. But they thought there was an audience still around for that, and indeed there was. And so I knew people involved with Star Trek, and so I put together a magazine all about Star Trek that had an episode guide to all 79 of the original Star Trek episodes. And we gave this magazine to that publisher and they got back to us a few weeks later and said, we can't publish this. It turns out that this is, you know, copyrighted by Paramount. I was just about to ask now. And, and we don't have the right to publish a Star Trek magazine, mm -hmm. so we have to give this back to you and we cannot pay for it. So I had all this great material about Star Trek. And I said, well, let's not do a Star Trek. We've got this material. Suppose we do a science fiction magazine and we've already got a great deal of material for the first issue about Star Trek. Right. And my partner said, okay, I don't know a lot about science fiction. I said, I do. I'm, I'm into that. So the first issue of Starlog featured Star Trek on the cover with Kirk and Spock, and we had that 79 episode guide in the first issue, and we dealt with other things too. But uh, the first issue was primarily all of that material, and then we used the rest of it over the next few issues. Our distributor, our magazine distributor, did his best to talk us out of publishing Starlog because he said there's no audience out there for a magazine of this sort. How many times has that been said, though, for things? There's no well, audience for he, it. He, he, in, in those days... That audience was invisible because right. there were no new star uh, uh, science fiction movies being made. Mm -hmm. There was no science fiction on television. There were there was no uh, you know big fan conventions that right. were in the news or anything like that. So he was right, and I I just knew that I couldn't be the only freak that was into all this stuff. That there had to be other people like me out there. I just didn't know how many or if there was enough to support a magazine, and our distributor wouldn't let us publish monthly to begin with. The only thing he would do was let us publish quarterly, four issues a year, because he said, you've got to have your sales figures from the first issue so you can see how much you right. didn't sell before you set your print order for the next issue. So that's what we did to begin with. And then this guy named George Lucas... A year later, in 1977, came out with Star Wars. It made the cover of Time magazine. There was a picture of an X-Wing fighter on the cover of Time, and we had that same picture on the cover of Starlog number 7. And I told George Lucas later when I met him, I said, our circulation doubled with that issue. All of a sudden, science fiction was alive again, and we were the voice of science fiction. Absolutely. Because we had already been there before it got hot. And so Starlog went monthly at that point. And from then on, we were not only covering Star Wars and Star Trek, 
but all the other stuff that was coming along in the world of science fiction, including fandom and conventions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I know for my, uh, myself, uh, Starlog and Fangoria were, were huge inspirations on, on fandom, especially since I'm in that generational gap of like, that was my source for a lot of my childhood, and then the internet came along. Right. And so, you know, I, I kind of straddle both of those. But, you know, my, my initial love for everything, you could only find it on Starlog or uh-huh. Fangoria. Or, but there was no other sources. Oh, I know. I know. That's why we had a, an audience that was very devoted, and most of them actually subscribed. Oh, yeah. And uh, as I have later learned... A lot of people had trouble subscribing because their parents didn't want them to, you know, subscribe to, especially a magazine like Fangoria. I mean, their parents didn't want them. It was a bloody magazine about horrible things, and they didn't want their kids subscribing. And a lot of them had to do it secretly, uh, you know, so that their parents wouldn't know about it. I was lucky with my parents. They were pretty okay with it, that kind of stuff. Lucky is right. Big into the. I was very big into the technical aspect of uh-huh. all that stuff. And so I would explain out, okay, this is how they do, you know, the, the blood packs. Right. And they're, she's, they're like, okay, well, at least... Special effects. Yeah, I love that stuff. So, uh, but I remember having to buy Fangoria uh, at the newsstand, and it was a brown paper bag. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Like, the, like it was almost like it was a nudie magazine. Well, we had to send our subscriptions out that way, too. And I rem- uh, Brian Fuller... Mm-hmm. Uh, who's you know a fairly famous director and exactly. writer, and he said that when he subscribed to Fangoria, he had to send it to a friend's PO box, and each month he would go over and get the magazine. And he said several times he found that because it came in a brown wrapper, that the post office people thought it was porno, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes he would go over there and his magazine had not arrived; it wasn't uh. there. Because the postal people had stolen it, thinking they were going to go home and see naked women. Well, at least they got educated <laughs> in one way or another. They, they learned very quickly yeah. that they weren't stealing what they thought they were. I, uh, uh, I've, I've, ta- I've been able to, through the podcast and through uh, various jobs I've had, I've been able to talk to a lot of people in the industry. And I'm glad to find out that I wasn't the only one that would uh, sit there in the middle of the night, blankets over flashlight reading fangoria like cover to cover it was it was a it was a every month uh-huh. it was an amazing thing so i'm very thankful for you for you to, to brought that out to us well the whole idea with all of the magazines that norm and i published and and there was you know quite a quite a slew of them we published comic scene right future life gore zone cinemagic all these other magazines oh, cinemagic definitely is hugely inspirational well I've heard that from a lot of people especially people that are actually making movies today I mean Mm -hmm. people like J.J. Abrams and Guillermo del Toro and Robert Rodriguez all said that Cinemagic was it educated them and it inspired them and it, it told them how to do this stuff but it also told them that they could do it so you've you've uh ended up over time selling the rights to the, the publishing rights to the magazines and you, you've uh, kind of transitioned from talking about fandom to actually being in fandom oh yeah so how's oh, that transition been? well I was in fandom all the way along yeah. I mean because when when you know the magazines started gathering their audience right uh, conventions started happening and very often they were kind of secret and not you know, uh, fan clubs were not as much out in the open in those mm-hmm. days. They would mimeograph a fanzine and mail it out to everybody. That's the way they kept in touch before the Internet. Uh, but they began to have little gatherings. And as these went on, one of the things we uh, learned after we started Starlog was that conventions started actually happening a little more out in the open in a public way. That's great. And we went to some of those conventions and to promote the magazine and people who ran conventions began to invite me as a guest to come and 
I got invited to AggieCon. I got invited to conventions. There was a time in the 80s when I was attending a convention almost every weekend somewhere. That must have been a great change, though, like to go from just everything being so quiet to, you know, I know you're a fan yourself, so being in your element that much must have been a great feeling. Well, it was loads of fun, but it was also, I mean, I would go back to the office on Monday and my editors would say, Carrie, how do you... How do you have the time to to go to these fan conventions? I mean, it's just it, you, you give up your weekend, right. you know, your only free time to go hang out with fans. And I said, let me tell you something. This is what I call market research, yeah. because I not only enjoy myself, but I I sit down on hotel hallway floors with fans and talk till two or three in the morning. I don't just do a presentation on stage and then go up to my hotel room and have a beer. You know, I, I sit down and I talk with the fans about what they like and right. what they don't like. And I learn that. And then I go back to our offices and I tell my editors what we should do more of and what we should do less of in the magazines. And I fine-tune the magazines so that they are targeting our actual audience. I, I could tell talking to you, um, and that's something I've had to learn over time doing this, is being an observer and, and learning learning what everyone's talking about. And because you don't want to talk about st- stuff that no one's talking about. So, right. yeah, that's that's a great thing to learn if you're doing anything like this. So. Right. And and I learned also I would write my my column that opened each issue of Starlog from the bridge right. and I would talk about my own adventures, some of them with fans, some of them with famous people and I, I would tell them my adventures so that they understood that I had a pretty damned exciting life exactly. and that you know this was something they could be involved in too and it was their world and I kind of brought them in on my own adventures and in the process, I encourage them to make the most of their life and to have their own adventures and to become the kind of creative person that they wanted to be and weren't sure they could be. And I, again, discovered years later that this actually had an effect on a lot of people who are now very successful in the world of entertainment and right. science fiction and horror and all of that, that people that are doing things of that sort, and because I told them that they could. I, I can tell you this. Um, what you did has been very influential. Actually, with the show even, uh, one of the things that I end every show off with is achieve greatness. And I always felt like if you really put your heart into it, yeah, you, you can get out there and you can achieve greatness. And I want everyone to, to be able to do that and, and express themselves. And that's something that I'm seeing that you're, you, you've been pushing for a very long time. Well, it's, it's, it's possible. It's you possible. have to connect to the real world. Exactly. I mean, th- the world that we're involved in is all about imagination and seeing the future that isn't here yet. Right. And, and, and you know, envisioning what might be and what ought to be. But once you connect to the real world, you can actually do things with your own life that uh, it's, it's not just a fantasy. It, it can actually happen. And I'm a perfect example of that because all the stuff that I was involved in from the time I, you know, Mighty Mouse was my hero, I, I have now come to live that life. I'm, I'm Mighty Mouse now, and I sing as I fly. Here you come to save the day. <laughs> exactly. I come in to save the day, and I try to pass that vibe on to other people that are that are receptive to it. And in fact, I have written a book about this very subject. It's called Reach for the Stars. It's not published yet, but it is a very practical guide to making your dreams come true and to achieving your own personal happiness. Right. And uh, soon, when the documentary from The Bridge comes out about celebrating the growth of fandom, I hope my book, Reach for the Stars, will be out, and there will be a lot out there in the world 
that will encourage the young fans of today to, you know, do amazing things. We absolutely need that positivity in this world right now. So. We need it desperately because it's not a happy world that we're in these days. And uh, this world of fandom, I think, is uh, tremendously important to the future of the human race. I absolutely agree. It's, uh, it's been very influential in many ways for a lot of people. I mean, you, you look even at tech and sci-fi and we have tech, the technology field, uh, you know, cell phones, whatnot, and then even to understanding how we react and how we, uh, you know, like a Star Trek, you know, the future where everyone gets along pretty much. Yes. I mean, that's what we want. And I think that's something that's really cool about uh, about fandom is that we're, we're able to do that. You know, we're able to say, "Hey, look, what connects all of this?" Yeah. Well, I I agree, and I think that uh, you know, it's it's not only that fans should treasure their own uniqueness and and their quirks and eccentricities and all of that sort of thing because. You know they should feel good about themselves, but it's because if they if they respect their own uniqueness, then they go out and do things that let that spread to the rest of the world. And fans have these days a tremendous influence on the general population. Thank you. And it's a very positive influence. Absolutely. And I love that I have seen the day that that has come to be, because that was not the case. In 1976, when we launched Starlog, uh, fans were disrespected uh, very openly. And so were horror movies and sci-fi movies. You know, people didn't, those didn't win awards. They weren't taken seriously. That was trash. It was like comic books. It's something you should outgrow when you become an adult. Yeah. And I totally disagree with that. Absolutely. Well, obviously. <laughs> I mean, we need to keep our heroes alive and keep, you know, saluting them and keep following their example so that the world we live in becomes a world that admires heroism and the battle for truth, justice, and your own happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is what it's called. <laughs> well, we try very hard to pursue that happiness. So, um... Uh, you are actually uh, helping out with the crowdsource right now for a movie. Yes, a little horror film that was made in Austin last year. Mm -hmm. I, uh, m the fellow who wrote it and directed it, asked me to play the lead role, which is a pretty hideous character uh, who kills and eats people. But uh, it's <laughs> called Evil for Dinner. He eats evil people. And he is now crowdfunding that. He's written a feature film script, and he wants me to play the lead in the in the movie when it gets set up. And I'm happy to do it. How does, it's, it, how does that feel though? Like going from <laughs> Starlog to to doing something like helping out the next generation of filmmakers and people in the industry. Basically. Something that would be in Fangoria, being actually there. And well, out. actually, that's what we did with Cinemagic. It was a magazine about filmmaking. Right. It educated people on filmmaking. And our Cinemagic yeah, no Short way. Film Surge, which was an annual awards competition, uh, saluted filmmakers who won awards with a trophy and you know publicity in the magazine and encouraged them to go on and make movies and so I've been doing that sort of thing for years because when I was in high school making my little eight millimeter movies that's what I needed was somebody to tell me take this seriously you can do it you can actually make real movies someday and that's what I want to say to the people of today especially fans who have you know this kind of crazy imagination that will produce things that are not just carbon copies of what we've already seen, but fresh visions that uh, take us to places we've never been. Thank you so much for doing the interview. It's a delight. I love talking about this sort of thing because this is my heart and soul. I can tell. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. So that was Kerry. Again, I told you, he's awesome. Yeah. Godfather, one of the godfathers of fandom. 
I mean, really, honestly. So, um, so those two people, amazing. It was so cool to like find them at AggieCon. Like, mm-hmm. that's the greatest thing about these cons. And we're gonna get more into AggieCon on the next episode, uh, because we have several interviews, and uh, I want to talk to uh, talk a little bit about AggieCon itself, like. I, I've decided when we go to these things to kind of try to learn something from when we go to a convention. So just going and we're interviewing and reporting and stuff. Like I want to, I want to feel like I've learned something, right? And so I definitely learned something, and I'll get into that in the next episode. It was it's kind of eye opening, but it it ran straight <clears> into <throat> meeting Carrie and Travis, who again completely new friends of the show. I mean, they, they, they yeah. feel like they're, they're, they're family. <laughs> and so, um, um, I'm excited to, uh, to help out their project and, uh, and see what goes, you know, what's going to happen. So guys, make sure to, uh, to hit the links in the show notes, give a few dollars here or there and, and help out with that. Uh, and, and get this, splatter fest going <laughs> and uh i mean just go check out check it out it's, it's really fun so yeah we got to i got to i got to with my wife got to go see um shazam and uh really enjoyed it sat down talked to uh mike and lachlan mm-hmm. at aggie con right During after AggieCon, yeah. right after i saw it and we <clears> talked <throat> about it so that's what's coming up next and then when we get back we're going to uh, eat some of these Mexican jalapeno M and M's, and I hope I have a new favorite M and M. I hope so too. But we'll be right back. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Lachlan, and it's recording. Why do you always do that? You <laughs> fucked up before. That's why. I didn't fuck up. I never yeah. fuck up. That's part of the father. It's father game, father, father gamer podcast. Let's, let's, let's talk about messing up. No, no, no. Let's let's talk about messing up. Okay. Somebody made the banner. Donnie. Yeah, Donnie. We'll we'll stick with Donnie. Stick with Donnie. <laughs> and, and and what happened to the banner? Uh, it got misspelled. Like what got misspelled? What mo- very important? The very thing- important R in the middle of the name. Of of, of whom? Of Father Gamer. Yes. So it's Faithy Gamer. Fate, faff Gamer. Or fate, fatty Gamer. Fatty Gamer. Fatty Gamer. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Fatty Gamer. <laughs> We're still blaming. <laughs> <you>. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a new, it's a new character in the Hundred Acre Woods. Fatty Gamer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, I got to go and see Shazam, um, last night, and want to talk about it very spoiler-free, because you guys haven't seen it yet. Correct. Which... Very correct. You know, maybe if somebody had gotten Fatigger Gamer correct, <laughs> they could have gone. No, no, no. <laughs> so, I got to go, and I went, I went with my wife, which, by the way, she's a great example of, of... <laughs> It has to be a movie that is for everyone, for her to like. She's except for the Chris's and uh, the Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything with the Chris's, she's good with. Yeah. But I think the Levi and my, Levi's might be part of that now too, though. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chuck. Yeah, exactly. And our Levi, 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 Levi. Levi. What is, how do you say his last name? I no clue. Okay. Funny. One of those things. Pronunciation is not my strongest suit. But yeah, well, neither is Mike's. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just fat heat gamer. Fat heat gamer. Oh, okay, it is true. <laughs> so, uh, so the movie itself. So let, let's get straight into that. Um, it was, it was really great. It it was something that I had a feeling DC was already proud of it, just mm-hmm. by the fact that they were doing the early sh- the early, the early showings. advanced showings. Yeah. And to this degree, at least. Yeah, because like, they haven't done that before. He said it was nationwide, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. And, I mean, two weeks early. Two weeks early. And so I was like... So I... Uh, you know, watching the trailers and watching how the... the how it's built up to this this far the the, uh, the advertising campaign and all that 
I mean, we had a good idea, it, and it is a really good idea of the movie itself, the, the, especially the later stuff. Of yes, it's a very funny movie. It, it's it's incredibly funny, but it has so much flippant heart in it that, and, and it has a lot of. It understands what it is. Yeah, it understands. Okay, this is a silly <laughs> premise. This is really silly. anything with magic too. It kind of gets in that realm of it's either Harry Potter or it's not Harry Potter. Right. Like it's just kind of funny. Yeah, and I, they know it. You can tell they know it, but it's not like and you and I were talking earlier. It's not quite to the Deadpool level of where like yeah. it, it, which it can't if it gets to that level. Uh, I. I don't think it could have been successful. No, it would be way too. It would, it would way have too been aware, way too aware much of it. Yeah. yeah, and and they understand. I mean, for the fact that like they've even showed it on some of the trailers and some of the the promotional stuff. Where, I mean, yeah. Justice League, and I mean, this is that universe kind of, probably softly rebooting is what it feels like. Um, where they're you know Batman and Superman and Aquaman all have action figures and and shirts and stuff, mm-hmm. but they're real people. And so, I mean, that's an interesting thing. Because if you watch the earlier movies, you wouldn't think there would be Batman, Superman, action figures and toys yeah. and stuff. Because the, the Snyder stuff, those people would not get at that kind of treatment <laughs> in, in that kind of world. Yeah. No, it's like, especially when they thought Batman was killing people. Yeah, you destroyed <laughs> our city. What the heck? They would. He would. They would not have action figures. Yeah. So. Um, the go ahead. Well, so I, I I think the DC needed some kind of soft reboot. Um, I think I personally think that Snyder is a is a good filmmaker, but I don't think what he was doing was working. No. And I think that they definitely wanted to move away from him. And it's one thing about Snyder is if you try to do an extended universe with him as a director as some of the works. It's really, really hard to get any of the other movies in your franchise to tonally match what he's doing. Exactly. Because he has a very, very, very specific style that makes every other movie feel like the tone is just a complete 180. No matter matter how you do it, because it's not Snyder. If you put put Shazam in a movie with, uh, with Batman from, you know... From Batman versus Superman, that's a weird movie. That's like one of those bad Never road trip on. movies type yeah. of thing. I mean, that is just you got the straight guy and you got the funny guy. Uh, no, you've got the freaking murderous, like I'm gonna kill you kind of guy. It's just no, it doesn't. It, it, I mean, for it Martha, yeah, for Martha. <laughs> oh, I know what Martha. Was her name? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. The, could be a Martha involved, and in, that would have almost been funny if they'd added that in Shazam. Um, <laughs> I, I think <laughs> Shazam's mom is Martha I, too. I think that uh, they want to forget the Martha moment <laughs> as much as possible. I think forward. everybody wants to forget the Martha moment. I mean, it's no Schumacher nipples, bad nipples moment. Yeah, that's nowhere not. near that bad. But, it's yeah. not. I mean, but they do want to bury it. It's almost bad credit card bad, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> they want to bury Martha. Uh, but it, the movie itself made because it's really hard to talk about the movie and not spoil it and I don't want to spoil it for you guys and really this is more of a touching base of the movie but I can tell mm-hmm. you I enjoyed the movie immensely I thought it was had a lot of whimsy in it and whimsy, whimsy. whimsy. and I thought it was I, I hate to be that guy that like you know, the for the movie poster kind of guy, but mm-hmm. it was magical. Like it was a magical <laughs> moment. That's the best way I can describe. Like I walked out of it, and there was a guy that was passing me, and he goes, "That's the Superman movie we should have gotten." Right. And that's the thing is, you know, Superman was always about hope, and, and Superman can be fun. You don't have to make a dark, brooding Superman movie. And I don't understand that why they did that. Well, well it's you got Zack Snyder to direct it. That's part what, of the reason. What I will say, uh, I think. I personally think that DC trying to make uh, darker and grittier movies than Marvel has is perfectly fine. No, it's uh, fine. I, I think that it's a. I think they need to do something to separate themselves from Marvel because mm-hmm. Marvel has already experienced uh, superhero fatigue within its own franchise. 
right. uh, DC needs to find a way to avoid that while still competing well, with another huge franchise. I mean, we talked about this earlier, but I think you know part of the problem was just the world building in general and trying to do tonally the same thing. And it's hard to, unless you're going to be passing out... Um, depression meds it's, it's hard you know like here's your popcorn and it's covered in you know whatever yeah unless they're doing that it's hard to totally keep that going for eight ten movies yeah like, and definitely not going to get the 20 movies that Mar- or 20 plus movies that Marvel's gotten out of yeah is, definitely not uh, I think the other big issue that they've had is they haven't they really haven't done any uh, character building no, and at least in the first couple, I think Wonder Woman and Aquaman are the two exceptions. And right. now but, I can say Shazam. So uh, yeah, so, so. But really, the thing that Marvel did was they spent years doing no world building or only hints of world building, but very heavy on character building and making you actually care to see the heroes again, not to see right. what the next plot point was. Because right. how many how many movies can you go? Oh, the bad Marvel movies. The bad guy was okay, and you're like, but I love the movie. And it's kind of the way with Shazam. Like, he's not terrible. He's not, and he, there's reasoning behind what's happening. Yeah. But, honestly, it was a Shazam, Shazam movie. It was an yeah. origin movie, which, those are always rough a little bit. Well, they, they can, can be. be. Yeah, they they're, can they're, be. They're, they they're be. good origin movies. And so, for me, for, for me, for them to do this and actually have an origin movie and it not be just bland or just overly ch- treaded kind of, kind of advi- uh, thing... It was great. I mean, God, I want to just talk about it so fast. Like, there's just so much stuff. But, and we, we could talk for hours about where DC messed up, but I can tell you this, with this movie, they've done right. Um, marketing it, they're doing right. I mean, you go on Twitter right after that early showing, and it was almost completely positive but you almost never see that on Twitter. Right. Yep. It was almost positive reviews. You go on Rotten Tomato, it's at 100%, which I'm sure something will come out tomorrow and it'll be at like 70% because somebody hates something about it. But right. as of right now, it's 100%, which is amazing. Yeah. I, mean, it, it, I think that it's definitely a step in the right direction for DC to actually produce some kind of a franchise. I'm kind of wondering if because they don't we don't know what's going to happen with Superman from here going on because it yeah. looks like what's his name's not going to be Superman Cavill yeah, it, yeah. It, it's very strongly looking like Cavill's and, leaving um, and it looks like you know Batman's leaving Affleck Batfleck is leaving and I actually like Batfleck like, I actually thought he was fine. Honestly, I thought his acting was probably the best part of Justice League. Yeah. Um, it's not saying a whole lot, but... No, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean him and, honestly, Aquaman, like, were my yeah. two favorite parts of Justice League. Yeah. And a lot of that, you could tell, the funny parts of it were written by Whedon. You could totally tell that was Whedon. Yes. The, the rope, the... the uh, her, her lasso, when he said on the lasso, that oh, was such a weird moment. That was... <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of that kind of moment, almost painfully Whedon. Yeah, very much. That kind of moment, though, is kind of what Shazam is, though. Yeah, and, and I think I think that's a good direction for DC to move in, mm-hmm. um, especially the greatest strength that Marvel has is that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a machine. Oh, absolutely. That yeah. There are big names in, but a lot of them, you can get somebody that's good at their job and they can slot in and oh, we're, continue we're working on We're about to hit that because we're mm-hmm. 20-something movies in. We're, ten, we're a decade in. We're yeah. 20-something movies, like 22 or whatever it is. We're about to see that transition from the early guard to new people like yeah. it's, it's happening because there, there's no way these actors are going to stay around for 20 years but so, I, yeah. I'm not even talking about actors I'm talking about everybody behind the scenes oh yeah you can have they've it's very segmented it's it's segmented and it gives a lot of room for uh, directors to make their own choices but also work within a greater system right that is cohesive yeah. like you know they're like Taika Waititi 
made a very, very stylistic movie in Thor Ragnarok. Absolutely. But it still works within the greater universe. Right. Uh, it, you know, in, in the same room as James Gunn, who has his own well, distinct style. It's also, it, it, it evolves. If you notice, like, the movies, if, if you go back, and that was one of the, the biggest either criticisms or just comments about uh, uh, Captain Marvel was it feels very much like a phase one movie. Oh, it absolutely does. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's jarring because we've evolved. Yeah. We've evolved yeah. to a certain point. We expect a certain thing from our Marvel movies because, you know, the, one of the big, biggest evolutions of those movies were the James Gunn movies. Yes, absolutely. And then stepping forward, the comedy, the adventure, all that stuff, you know, we, we get Thor Ragnarok and whatnot. Mm. But I, I can argue, and just how it feels, Sam oh, is definitely, is, is, is thankful, can be, uh, how Shazam is made, you can definitely tell there's a reason behind it, and I can tell you it's gun and it's it's uh, uh, Thor Ragnarok, and in those movies, you can tell that, hey, you know what, we can make these fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, what I was what I was trying to say earlier was the thing that DC has done is they have such a heady stylistic overtone mm-hmm. that. Any deviation from it in the last couple movies has just made it feel like it's not even a part of the universe. Like, honestly, Wonder Woman did not feel like it was part of the extended universe. Totally. Which which is a really big problem. Because when the best... When the best movie in your franchise feels disconnected from everything else, that's a problem. Well, it's... it's, (laughs) You know, all of them do. Like yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah, they they don't feel like Aquaman doesn't really work. Aquaman with his, doesn't work with it either. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't really. I mean, the characters are there. I feel it. It's sort of like when you write in comics when you read those multi-artist and uh, uh, author-driven storylines, and you have someone like a Frank Miller, and then all of a sudden you have someone like a Kevin Smith. <laughs> yeah, both it's, both okay. talented. But yes. tonally, just, they're completely different. And it just doesn't work together. No. And, and I think that was a big issue that DC had. and mm-hmm. They still have. Well, but... Right now. Well, they, they I, think what, I, I, I think what Shazam is doing is it's pivoting away right. from the way that the early DCEU was. And they're trying to do a soft reboot yeah. that it gives them room to move forward. I, I, have, I have this sinking suspicion that Shazam is going to be the temple now. Like... He's going to be... Because, again, we don't know who Superman's going to be. We don't know yeah, anything yeah. about that. I, I think I think they have to keep Gal Gadot and Jason Momoa. No, no, they will yeah. be. They will. And Because and, I was um, going to say, he was that the, the Aquaman film, because it was so different, it was a lot more enjoyable to me. Oh, yeah. And I can see that as the starting point of the actual change. Oh, Honestly. no, no. It, it is the actual change, but I'm talking, like, Going forward, going forward though, Shazam is the next best step. I, I think he might For be. Sure. I don't know because depending on how they want to go forward. I mean, okay, we are getting the Batman at some point. Yeah, which right. <clears throat> how everything is sounding, it's going to be connected a lot more to the Joker, right. which is very art house and very dark and very gritty. And I mean, he's yeah. The director's comparing yeah. it to Taxi Driver, <laughs> <laughs> so which is, I mean. It could be very... I, personally, I'm super excited for the new Joker movie. Oh, absolutely. But um, yeah. it definitely... But the thing is, you can have darkness within a franchise. Absolutely. But oh, when, even, even when, Shazam has darkness to it. And But when the overtone of the entire franchise is darkness, it's really hard to do anything outside of it without feeling totally disconnected. All I think and they of did is, not succeed. All I think of is Lego Batman of the, uh, the my parents are dead, I wear black, <laughs> <or> darkness. <laughs> like, that's all I think about at yeah. that point. So, I don't know. Uh, when the movie comes out and everyone has time to see it, we'll sit down and we'll talk about it even more and break it down and have a spoiler filled preview talking about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. See how it yeah, fits into the fun. bigger cinematic universe. Because I have sinking suspicion we're going to find out more. I mean, we've got... I mean, it still sounds like Gunn is still going to make Suicide Squad. And Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's... Like, he 
signed off and started on it already. Yeah, so and I'm they're filming. Sure he has to finish that. They're filming um, the Birds of Prey movie right now, mm-hmm. uh, which still has uh, Mar- Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. Yeah. So I think it is. They're just gonna pick and choose. They're gonna pick and choose the things that worked. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, she worked. People that worked. She worked. And yeah, I'll, even if the movie didn't, I do think Margot Robbie's performance was there. Uh, you know, and I'm going to be, this is going to get me beat up a little bit. I didn't think Leto was that bad. I just don't think the direction was that great. Oh, well, and the even, thing is, even, they kind of shoehorned him in there anyways. Yeah. I, well, I, he had more, there was more he did, and it just never made the it never made yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think the way his Joker was presented was a failure, uh, and I don't think his performance helped it. Uh, maybe if it was directed and written better or yeah. well I, I did hear a lot uh, the editing of the movie pretty heavily brutalized his role in particular right. in particular yeah. um, so yeah, there's some stuff in the extended version that I'm like okay I, I the problem is and we've, we've talked about this a lot on the show is that the term we came up with the, the Reeves effect is, yeah. is like you had the ledger effect pretty much yeah and Anybody who took it's almost good that Leto came in and did that so that whoever comes into the mantle next, which now we know who it is, um, kind of gets the fresh start, kind of almost because it, was, yeah. it wasn't Leto, it was you know, it wasn't this. I mean, that that's true, <laughs> it's definitely, of course. Uh, Personally, I think uh, if we could have just skipped over Leto and gone straight to a Joaquin Phoenix version uh, of the Joker, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, mean, I think the, that has, even has, the, has good even potential. Even the director of Suicide Squad has been like out and said, "Look, it just wasn't quite what I wanted." Yeah. So. Well, it, so from from what I understand, happened with that is after the first uh, ad came out, and the, that the first ad was. Absolutely spectacular. Yeah. They signed on the ad company to do a ton of the editing for the movie, which uh, is a terrible idea. Yeah, because they know uh, how to cut... Ads, ads are not movies. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, any 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 uh, movie producers listening, don't do that. Well, it's like if you, if you go back in the 80s and, and especially the 90s, there's a lot of movies that are like beautifully, beautifully shy, and, but in small segments because... Hollywood was hiring music video directors yeah, right and, and left. And it, yeah. it's incredibly stupid. I mean, there are there are a few exceptions they did really well. Well, but but it's it's there there are people that know how to do it. With it. There are people that know how to edit well, and there are people that know how to edit their genre well. Right. Both right. of them are valuable, but you need to make sure that if you change genres, the people that are editing your content know how to edit that genre. Exactly. Right. So we'll definitely cover this more. Um, I can say my my greatest praise to the movie is, and anyone who knows me knows I absolutely love Edgar Wright. There are moments in this movie I felt like it was an Edgar Wright film. So that right there, that's high praise to me. I mean, I'm I never go back to see a movie, and when y'all go to go see it at some point, like in the near future, I'm going with you again. Like I, 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 I I'm excited to go see it, and we've got. Yeah. And next month we've got Hellboy. I'm we've got yeah. a lot of stuff. And we've got Endgame. Should be interesting. And <laughs> Endgame is going to be uh, incredible. <laughs> I love the fact that uh, the the Roosters came out and said, uh, "Yeah, you're right. Most of the footage that's in the trailer, probably not most of it, but a lot of it is not going to be used in the movie." Really? Well, yeah. Uh, wow. One thing that I'm fairly sure happened with that is because. This is going to be a gigantic, uh, it's going to be a whale of a movie, and I'm excited for it, but I guarantee they got, you know, probably five and a half, six hours of stuff oh, yeah. that's usable, and they're going to cut it down to like three. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, yeah. Can, can and you it, wait to the extended cut when they have both movies together, and <laughs> it's like... 22 hours long and yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be like a Lord of the Rings the extended don't match edition up at all. no 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 they will, they will. <laughs> no it'll be it'll be the thing is <laughs> this is the kind of movie where I bet that they just have like six hours of footage ready to oh, go yeah. yeah and they just need to pick exactly how to make the final product but when you if you do a full director's cut edition it could very easily be a great five and a half hour movie 
uh, yeah. which will be very interesting to watch because they. Uh, I was honestly shocked at how good Infinity War was. Like I expected it to be fun, but it was a tight movie oh, yeah. that went between an, a, just an, a legitimately absurd number of storylines. It should not be possible to go and have a movie make sense with that many storylines. I have, I have this theory about, and this is going to end this, this segment off in a second, but I have this theory because uh, I can't think of his name who made uh, the, the last Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi. Um, uh, Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson. There's talk that he's supposed to make another trilogy for Star Wars that's outside of the Luke and stuff, and there's talk that he might not be doing that anymore, or, or that may be already done, I don't know. There's been, there's been talk about it. I have this sinking suspicion that if that does happen, I would not be surprised if the Russos don't get it. Like, I yeah. really... Because if anybody can do that space opera, that multiple characters, multiple situations, I mean, they've proven it now, and especially with... That many. I mean, the Marvel people aren't terrible compared to a lot of big stars. I mean, there are actually a lot of them have a pretty good head on their shoulders, from what I've been told. Yeah. But that's a lot of egos that they had to juggle still. Yeah. And they did a really good job, at least in the first one. We don't know about Endgame yet, but. That's true, but I mean, like. I mean, there could be a fumble, but I don't think so far they haven't given us any indication that's a possibility. And. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think enough is riding on this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, if if it wasn't going to live up to the expectations of Infinity War, I think they would have delayed it. Yep. Legitimately, I think they would have yeah. delayed it. Uh, I think that that, that, that done, basically awesome. never happens. You know, like this, this doesn't happen with Disney, but with with this movie specifically. I yeah. think they would have delayed it if they weren't happy with the result. No, yeah, because so. this is this is the this is, this is eleven years. Yeah, yeah. This, this is, is eleven years. Billions of dollars, easily. Yes. Like this uh, is very likely, very likely to break a billion. Oh, definitely. I guarantee you. Like, I mean, it probably very quickly too. And yeah, so. I, I, I'm never going to say that it's a guarantee that a movie is a guarantee to break a billion. But uh, I would be surprised if this wasn't. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those in, 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 uh, in uh, Vegas where they. I don't even think they're taking the bet. They're just like, no. It, yeah, it's I, th I think the over under. I mean, we could look it up, but I'm gonna guess it's around two and a half. Yeah, two and a half billion. Yeah, I, I could see that, especially with China and with everything. I oh, see. China's gonna eat this thing up. Oh yeah. They love special. They love high special effects sci-fi movies. They love. They love, They seem to love the Marvel movies too. So, yeah. uh, heck, they even uh, Aquaman did really well over there. Yeah. Really so nice. yeah. So, well, guys, thank you for listening. Um, guys, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll be back in just a minute. So that was a lot of fun. Like I really, really enjoyed. It. Like I've had time to think about Shazam, and mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And I actually want to go back and see it again. And I'm not one of those people that go back a bunch of times. It opens to see this movie. weekend, right? Yeah. So I'm excited to go see it again. Like I really like to go see it again. Um. Plus, I want to. I want to. You know, my few dollars to help out because I really. I I hope this movie just explodes because mm -hmm. it's just so much fun. The problem, um. It does face is backlash from some of the other DC movies. I mean, granted, <laughs> Aquaman helped, uh, Wonder Woman helped, but everything Martha, else. Yeah, what did you say? Yeah, we we talked about that already. We don't need to get into that. But <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and let's get into these M and M's uh, and uh, hold this right quick. We're gonna open these M and M's uh, and so everybody listening while I'm opening these M and M's. You're saying M&M's. 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 Uh, so, we have a link in the show notes to... Harder uh, than the noise. Yeah. No. Well, I'm opening up a... I can't really open up quiet. <laughs> uh, we have a link in the show <clears throat> notes to the uh, all the stuff for Evil for Dinner. And I'll give it a gander. You know, go look at it right quick. And uh, like I said, if you have a few dollars, throw it, throw it, throw it their way. They're, they're a really cool group of people. So, 
Um, they have an event on April 13th at Muck Shots in Austin, Texas. So if you happen to be in the area, they're going to have T-shirts and, and a whole bunch of other stuff for contributors. So that's Mug Shots in Austin, Texas. Also, again, check out their thing, uh, their link in the show notes. Here is three of these M&Ms. Okay. Um, I'm going to do three. I don't think they'll be yeah, hot. smell interesting. Do, how, yeah, let's describe. I mean, you can smell the jalapeno. You can jalapeno. smell the heat. Yeah, I mean, well, you can smell the jalapeno, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about the heat, but I can <clears> smell <throat> the jalapeno. So. That's kind of cool. Oh. I'll put them in. Uh, oh, all three of them? Great okay. radio. Yeah, all three of them. Yeah. In your mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. See, normally, I fuck all my m and so. <laughs> Okay. Maybe three was not right. Maybe it was too much at one time. But No, it was okay. No, I'm talking about, like, trying to eat it. Oh, yeah, enough. yeah. No, yeah. that makes sense. There's a... Heat. Tiny heat. Mm-hmm. Like after the fact. Like once you get through the sweet. Well <clears throat> No, there's some heat. There's definitely some heat. I only tasted it after I got rid of the well, yeah, yeah. No, the it, chocolate. I mean that's that's, that's Which makes heat. sense. Yeah, but. that's any heat. Yeah. So um, do I hate them? No. No. They're actually pretty good. Am I gonna buy another bag of them? Probably not. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, instant digestion, instant uh, heartburn. I got it. <laughs> you did, yeah. yeah well, that's I also funny. have a tiny stomach now. Yeah, that's true. Um, I would probably get some more. Where'd you uh, get them at? Uh, well, in our area, HUB, which is a okay. local grocery store chain. Um, apparently there are three. There are three kinds right now. There are in the United States. I don't know. Let me know if they're outside of the United States. But in the United States, it's supposed to be you can win a trip uh, all around the world, mm-hmm. and. Uh, the other two flavors are English toffee, which I liked. Yeah, that was a good one. And then Thai coconut, which I thought might have been spicy too, but it wasn't at all. But this this does have a little bit. Oh, of Oh, because kick. the coconut has a little bit of a. Well, weird... Thai. I was thinking Thai. Oh, yeah. gotcha. <clears throat> and it's, it tastes actually really good. Uh, I was thinking about it. I don't think there's been a lot of M M&M, and uh, M stuff with coconut, so it's interesting. Not really, no. Not that yeah, I those can are okay. Those like are okay. Them. I I don't know long term. Like I might give you, I might give you half the bag <laughs> if yeah, you want because I don't think I'd. Eat. I'll eat them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I crave chocolate all the time now, yeah. so I'll eat that. But um, so if you want to hear more about uh, M and M's or <laughs> anything else we're doing, <clears throat> you can check us out at uh, Twitter. It's at Father Gamer. Or at Silverhawks No Vowels, or uh, at Father Gamer, Father Gamer Pod. Pod. Yeah, um, you can check us on YouTube, the uh, Father Gamer Podcast. Yeah. Uh, you can check us out on Instagrams. You can check us out on Facebook, of course, mm-hmm. and you can check us out on a plethora. That's right, I used plethora. A plethora of different uh, streaming services. For, for the show. I mean, mm-hmm. we're on everything now. We're on a lot of Yeah, crap. we're on Spotify, our crap, radio. I mean, actually, really good crap. Um, yeah, so check us out. Like us. Fr- uh, favorite us. I was a friend us, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, let us know that you're listening. I love it when people let us know we're listening. Um, I actually had some fans we picked up from AggieCon. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, this is one story before we leave. Yeah. Um, so... I had uh, I'd popped a few. See, the problem with it, with with this whole <laughs> surgery, though, the problem with the whole surgery thing is, and uh, is you know they took ninety percent of my stomach out. So sometimes my eyes will definitely be bigger than the rest of my body, as far as right. like. And so I I popped a handful of cereal and a couple of crackers as I was walking out the door, and it just kind of stuck. Like it felt <laughs> like it stuck. It ended up going to a local game store. And uh, uh, ran into a couple people. They were fans of the show. They become fans and listen to like all the episodes they could. Yeah, it's really right cool. Ag- Ag- I out. love that stuff. That's yeah. great. That makes me happy because it makes me feel like I'm doing something that people are listening right. to. And so, you can sign autographs. So that's that's always so. I, I you know it's cool. Love it. And uh, try to act all cool and everything. Walk outside, and it decided just to <laughs> come up. Like like a <clears throat> ball of like stuff. It just did not right in front of this thing. These 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 two people, and that's you know that is a that is a thing. No matter what happens to you, no matter like 
if all of a sudden I become an Academy Award winning whatever or become whatever, we all throw <laughs> up. We all poop. We all do all that stuff. We're all the same. We just sometimes have cooler jobs. So, And that's what any of us really want is to poop but have a cool job. So, everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting us. Again, check out the links. Help out that movie. And uh, check us out at Comic Palooza. Thank you, guys. And remember, as always, achieve greatness.